Most of you probably already know this. Uh, anytime you see words in your Bible, if you have a Bible that is red, <clears throat> that means these are the words of Jesus. And so the words we're reading today are specifically words that the gospel writers recorded of him during his time here on earth teaching. And so beginning in verse 19 of chapter 6, Jesus began to say this, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning once again for giving us the privilege and opportunity to be able to stand here in your presence and in your house to proclaim your word and to teach your word. Lord, I always ask this request, and that is that you would forgive me of the sin that is in my life. I realize I stand here today as a sinner, and I need forgiveness of my own sin. And so I plead the blood of Jesus today. God, help us today as we study your word that you would speak truth into our heart. I pray that it would become a reality to us all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Leave your Bible open here. We're going to be looking at a lot of scripture today. But it begins with one word. One word I want you to jot down, put on your outline, and do not forget. In fact, it's a word that all of you probably are a little bit familiar with. It's the word worry. You've heard me preach messages on worrying time and time again. And you may be thinking, why would you preach another one? Well, because my conversations with you reveal the simple fact that you haven't stopped worrying. Maybe a few of you have, but overall, we just tend to be people that worry. I think it's a true statement to say that worry is a part of our life. I could take it a step further and say also that worry has become a pastime in the lives of many of us. Worry, worrying uh, um, preoccupies our time. We spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of emotion in worrying. And so it takes a great deal of our time, but worrying is something that's very dangerous to us all. And far beyond all the bad things that I could say to you about worry, do you realize that Scripture teaches us that worry is a sin? It is a sin for any child of God to spend all of their day worrying. And I tell you that because worrying is the equivalent of saying to God, God, I know that you mean well. But Lord, I don't know if you're really going to come through in this situation. Now, you may not imagine yourself saying that to God. God, I know you mean well, but this is even beyond you. But when we worry, that's exactly what we're saying. Worry is a disruption of the promises of God and of the providence of God. Someone once said it this way. They said, worry is interest paid on trouble before it's due. Now, did you get that? Worry is interest paid on trouble before it's due. Some time ago, I heard a pastor on the radio sharing a story about a, when he had been on a, a plane flight, and he was flying across the country, and uh, he said he had flown many times, but as he was flying this particular day, there was happened to be some storms that were uh, brewing out in the skies there. And the captain came on and he said, I want everybody to fasten their seatbelt because we're going to be approaching this storm. They went on a few minutes later and the captain came on again and the lights began to blink and the fasten your seatbelt sign come on and the captain said, I apologize for this, but we'll not be able to serve you any drinks today because we're going to get ready to hit some turbulence. Well, the turbulence began, and the captain came on again, and he said, Folks, it's vitally important that you have all of your safety belts on because we are entering into a very dangerous storm. And that pastor told the story that as he looked around, and that cabin began to get darker and darker, and what once was a sunny day turned into darkness, he could see outside the, the lightning begin to flash and light up that plane cabin. And he said he could also, even over those engines of the plane, could hear the thunder as it roared. And as they approached that storm, he said that the turbulence began to hit and that plane began to dip and dive and he was just certain that it would be plunged into the ocean. And so he began to look around and notice all kinds of people praying. A couple people he noticed happened to even be on 
their knees, which is interesting because they were supposed to be in their seatbelt. So I guess they thought it would be easier to uh, be on their knees praying to God than in their seatbelt. He said one lady had a rosary that she was holding and was praying and many others had their hands that happened to be crossed. But he said he noticed in all of this, he looked back and there was this young girl that sat across from him, one row back, and this young girl was, happened to be on her iPad and she had some earphones on and she'd take them off and then she was reading a book and he said she was totally unaffected by everything that was going on. Every once in a while, she said, he said her head would perk up over the seat and she would look around and go right back to what she was doing while all the adults in the room seemed to be a little bit frantic. Finally, they came through the storm and the plane landed and he, as he was making his way off that plane, he said he stopped by that little girl and he said, I have to ask you a question. He said, how is it that you was so calm during all of that flight that was so out of control? And she said, Mr., because my daddy's the pilot and he's just taking me home. Tells a very true story, does it not? When we know who's in charge, it affects the way that we view our problems. It certainly affects the worry that we have in our life. When we know that God is our, co our, God is our pilot and we're just the co-pilot going through life, it affects the way that we view all the worries that we have. I remember about 30 years ago, I guess it was about 30 years ago, I'm trying to think how long that would have been. I was in high school at that time, and um, yeah, that would have been about 30 years ago. And uh, there was a song that was very popular by a man by the name of Bobby McFerrin, and the song was called Don't Worry, Be Happy. Who remembers that song? We won't sing it today, but it was a catchy little tune, and they sang it with a... Um, some type of little accent and boy when that song was in your head you couldn't get it out of your head today I thought about having brother Joseph sing uh, that for us today but I wasn't sure if it had anything in there that maybe we shouldn't hear in church so to speak so uh, I didn't have him do that but um, that song speaks exactly the words of the way the Christian should live their life and that is we should not worry but we should always be happy in fact this is nothing new because this is the same thing that Jesus said the problem is that's not always a simple thing to do. Now, let's be very practical today and let's think about what's got us worried in our life. In fact, can you narrow it down to one thing in your life perhaps that you worry about day in and, th and day out? Worry is a really an interesting animal if you think about it because there's some things we tend to worry about. There's other things that don't bother us at all. See, all of us went to bed last night and not one of us spent the whole night up praying and worrying that the sun was not going to come up this morning. Never entered our mind. Do you know why? Because we just take it for granted. We know that God's got the universe in control. We don't need to pray that God's going to make the sun rise today. We just knew that it was going to happen. And God did make the sun rise today. And do you realize that God tells the ocean exact, exact where as one song says, exactly where to stop? And if God can handle all of that, then do you think he might be able to handle these little problems that we have in our life? Well, it comes back to this passage where Jesus was teaching on this very principle. And when we read this passage and we study it, we learn how we can deal with worry that comes in our life. I want to give you a very quick outline this morning that will help us understand this. And I want you to jot this down. Number one, we must rethink our priorities. And if you go back to verse 19 of, of uh, Matthew chapter 6, I want you to notice what Jesus says. He says, lay not, circle that word not, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Worry. Jesus is talking about the worry that we have in our life. And by the way, do you know what the old English word for worry is? It's the word to choke or to strangle. And that's what worry does for us. And that's why Jesus had given this uh, passage here. Because this passage applies to the way that we live our life as well. And so when Jesus speaks these words, many would say, well, he's talking about money. He's saying don't worry about money. Jesus is talking about worrying in general. You don't read where Jesus took up an offering. That was not his purpose in writing this. 
The point was, if money is your top priority and that's your only priority, then you're never going to have a life filled with peace. And so Jesus is saying to them, don't worry about those types of things. In fact, move on to verse 24. There's a couple of verses here I want to point out to you today. Verse 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for neither he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So he's not telling us that, listen, you can't have a retirement account. Jesus would not say something like that. But Jesus is making the point, don't spend your entire life compiling wealth with no intention of ever using it and worrying about when just a little bit of it is gone. It's what one person referred to as that Scrooge mentality. And we have some Scrooges here today. Don't think that we don't. We have a couple Scrooges in the building. We don't need to point them out, but we all know that we have them in our midst, and you just may be that one. And by the way, when you have that mentality Jesus teaches us, then it's never enough. Oh, but yes, I have to prepare and I have to plan. There's nothing wrong with that. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus tell us not to prepare and not to plan, but Jesus does tell us not to put our trust in those things, especially when it comes to money. He's saying to us, we must rethink what our priorities actually are. You know, we're living in a time where we must rethink what priorities really are. One thing lacking, I think, in the lives of many Christians would be the words of Jesus in verse 25 of Matthew 6. I want you to read this with me. He said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What shall you eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on? Is not the life more than meat, and the body than remnant? He's saying, talking about our clothes, and the things that we wear, and the things that we eat, and we spend so many times uh, talking about that, and he's saying, you have to rethink what your priorities really are. You know where I've seen this? probably clearer than I've ever seen it before at any time in my life. How many of you remember this past year, maybe it's a year before, in the past 18 months, the world went on a shortage of toilet paper. How many of you recall that? Remember that? And people were frantic. If you went into the store, they would pay top dollar for toilet paper. Why? Because their priorities were all mixed up. And then when we got toilet paper back in the store, what happened? Some of you decided it was time to stock up and fill your cupboards and fill your whole house with toilet paper because you can't live without toilet paper. I'm sorry for the illustration today, but can I tell you what me and my friends used to do when we'd be out playing ball and there was a field close by? We didn't go home to use the bathroom. I'm just going to tell you that. And we survived just fine. But something in our society today tells us, listen, you can't live without these certain things. And what Jesus is saying is, you won't trust me with your most basic need. How can we ever trust God with the big things in our life when we won't trust him with the simplest things in our life? And so Jesus challenges them just to rethink their priorities. How many of you are glad today that you have that visual in your mind of the pastor out in the cornfield? I just want to know how many of you, that's, you know, don't worry, be happy is a song you'll never get out of your mind. And now that's a visual you'll never get out of your, out of your mind as well. So you can thank me for that later. There's a second thing today that will help us when we talk about worry. And that is by trusting in God's provisions. Now we just spoke about this a minute ago. I want you to think of your children or your grandchildren, what is it that they worry about? Do they worry that they won't have a place to live? Do they worry they're not going to have their next meal? I don't think our children worry about that. But they worry about things that are actually beyond their control. And this is interesting because when we worry, we worry about things that we think are beyond God's control. And it takes me back to the question, what in your life is beyond God's control? Well, go down to verse 26 very quickly in Matthew 6 and listen to what Jesus said. He said, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? I go down to verse 27. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for remnant? He's talking about clothes. And then he gives this beautiful illustration. He says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. 
They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If you know anything about Solomon, Solomon had it all. I mean, in today's standards, he had it absolutely all. And Jesus says, but look at those lilies in the field and how beautiful they are. And God has taken care of even the details in their life. Now notice very quickly verse 31, if you'll drop down there. Jesus commands us and he says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. I want you to listen to me today, folks. One thing Jesus said you can always count on is that God is going to meet your needs. If you hear nothing else that I say today, you need to be reminded as his child that God has promised to meet all of your needs. Now, does this mean that you'll have no problems in your life? No, that does not mean that at all. But it does mean that when problems come, God does not give us a multiple choice. And he says, here's the problem. You pick, you know, A through E. It doesn't work that way. We trust that God knows what's best, that God has said, I will meet all of your needs. You have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. Now go back to verse 32. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. He knows it before you know it. You know why we worry? We worry because we're not sure of what's going to happen. We worry because we don't know the outcome. But why would we worry when we truly know the Creator? There is a third and final thing I think that Jesus teaches us about worry this morning, and that is that we have to live in the present. This may be one of the most important things that Jesus teaches us here, and it's, exact, it's exactly what he says in verse 34. Take note, he says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. That means don't worry about tomorrow. All the what-ifs in life. What if this happens? What if... That happens. Years ago, I remember a lady came into a counseling session and she had said to me, Pastor, I've feared this all my life. I knew all of my life that my son was going to turn out the way that he turned out. And I have feared this. I have worried about this. And sure enough, it has come true. And I looked at her and I smiled and I said, aren't you glad that it came true? Because think of all that time you would have spent wasted worrying if it hadn't come true. I don't know that that was the response that she was specifically wanting. But hey, at least all the worrying paid off. What good does it do us to worry? Oh, I can give you a couple things it does that's not good. It causes your blood pressure to go up. It causes you to feel sick. It can give you a migraine. In fact, the things we worry about fall into two categories. Either we can change them, number one, or we can't change them, number two. Every single thing you're worried about in your life right now falls into one of those two categories. Either I can do something to change this, or it's totally, totally out of my control. Now listen, if it falls in the category of something that you can change, then guess what you should be doing? Not sitting around doing nothing, but you should be doing what you can to do your part to change that. But why would you worry about whether or not the sun's going to come up tomorrow? Why would you worry about things that are totally out of your control? You know, as frustrated as I get sometimes with the way that the world goes, with uh, politics, with, with government, um, I mean, I worry about that stuff sometimes. Do you ever fall into that category? You just worry, and it goes something like this. Well, I'm not worried about me, but I'm worried about the life my kids is, are going to have and my grandkids. And, and I think about things like that that I never did before. And you know what I'm really saying? I'm saying, God, I know that you can do all things and you're in the midst of this, but Lord, really, if you would just let me do things my way, the world would be totally different. Now, that's pretty arrogant to think that way. We need to be worry-free and say, God, you have handled this thing for seven, 8,000 years. I think you can take it from here. You've been calling for seven, 8,000 years for the ocean to stop where it stops, for the world to keep spinning, for the stars to stay in place, and so God, I think you can handle it for one more day. See, we have to come to that point in our life where we just live in the present. Now, that doesn't mean we live carefree. 
we go out and spend all of our money today and, you know, get a bunch of debt. That's just foolish living. But Paul said it this way in Philippians 4, 6. He said, be careful or worry, he's saying, for nothing. But in everything, by, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Do you know why I think God allows us to worry sometimes? You want to know when my prayer life has been the best? And I say this, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I'm just, I'm being transparent with you today. You pray for me, I'll pray for you, but I'm telling you, the times in my life when my prayer life has been the best has been when my health has been the worst. When every time I think I'm dying, which has been about four times in my life, suddenly I get real spiritual, real holy and real righteous, and man, you won't find a better Christian than me. I read my Bible more, I pray more, I talk more like a Christian, I dress more like a Christian. I just fit the part. And then God answers that prayer, and you know what happens? Now, I, I see some of those looks you're giving me right now. I, I could be talking about you, just so you know. God answers that prayer, He brings us through, and then we fall right back into where we happen to be before. Today, I want you to think, as we leave this building today about one problem, not all of your problems because most of them aren't worth worrying about anyway, but one thing that's got you worried. Is it your health? Is it your finances? Is it your marriage? Is it your children, your grandchildren? Is it your church? Is it the economy? Is it the way that things are? You put that one thing on your list. And I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. What are my priorities here? Am I seeking God first in what I'm worried about? Ask yourself this question. Have I prayed about it? Now, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want anybody to see how foolish we really are, but I could raise my hand to this. Have you ever prayed something and actually thought to yourself, I wonder if God is really listening to me? I mean, he hasn't answered this prayer, and I've been praying and praying and praying and praying, and I wonder if God is really listening to me. You know you've thought that. You may not have been... Uh, someone that would verbalize that, but we've all felt that way before because if God doesn't answer our prayer immediately the way that we want it answered, we make an assumption that He's not answering our prayer. And that's not true. God's just saying to us, you don't understand what's going on. I created all of this. I understand all of this. Let me be in charge. And when I come to that conclusion, that God just needs to be in charge and not me, it takes a lot of pressure off of my life. A whole lot of pressure off of my life. And it gives me a lot less to worry about. Now think about that worry and ask yourself this question finally. Have I taken action in the direction of that worry? Is there really anything that I can do about it? Or is this something I totally have to give to God? Remember, they fall into one of two categories. Either I do something to change this and I no longer have to worry about it, or there's nothing that I can do. And so guess what? i got to leave it in the hands of God. You want me to give you a real practical illustration before we close the day? Every four years and every two years and even locally, uh, we have elections. And what can turn you in a bad mood worse than when your candidate does not win? So what do you do? Well, you just vote again. Well, God's not hearing my prayer. Well, God is in control. You're not in control. It comes back to, I'm going to wake up today. I am an American citizen. I live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. I am proud to be here. I am glad God has given me this opportunity. As of right now, we still have the freedom to meet right here in this building. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. That's in God's hands. I'm going to pray about it. He could come back today and take us out, and that's a lot of time in my life that I haven't spent worrying about something I have no control over. So I want to challenge you this morning to think about your worries, put them in those two categories, things I can change, things beyond my control, and the things that are beyond your control, do not allow Satan to use them to tear you down, to make you miserable, to stress you out, to cause you to fight with your spouse, to cause you to be mean to the children, to cause you to have a bad attitude all the time, and just say, God, this is beyond my control, this is in your hands. I want to tell you something, church. It will change the way that we live our daily Christian life when we put the world in that perspective.